Good evening. Glad to have you with us tonight here at North Lake, uh, particularly for our online folks tonight. Uh, we've got a little bit of uh, inclement weather coming in at some point, and so I think the majority of our folks are joining us online. So no matter where you are, uh, I want you to just kind of pull up a, a chair or seat or uh, just relax a little bit and let's rest in the Lord and uh, rest in His Word tonight as we continue to worship Him. Tonight I want to remind you of a verse found in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22 that says, Let us draw near with a true heart that is full of assurance of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight we're going to sing a little bit about that. So I want you to sing with me tonight. I am thine, O Lord, draw me nearer. So sing. You'll see the words on the screen. Sing out this evening as we worship the Lord. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and thy will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day, and we thank you that we can draw nearer to you and in doing so father we can draw near as it says in hebrews with a true heart that is has full assurance of the faith that we have placed in you so tonight father we are thankful for what your son has done for us what he has done for us on the cross and as it says at the end of the hymn draw us nearer to thy precious bleeding side may that be a reminder to us of the sacrifice that your son made the perfect lamb of god made on the cross for us, made for us as sinners. So, Father, we can be uh, made clean and whole in you. And so, Father, we pray tonight for those that have not yet accepted you or those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, that, Father, today may be the day that uh, you, you uh, allow them to uh, see who you are and what you've done and the hope that is found in you. And, Father, in doing so, that they turn their lives over to you, acknowledging that they are a sinner, uh, acknowledging that they have done wrong, and Father, repenting from that and turning away and accepting you as Lord and Savior of their life. And may they continue to follow and tell others uh, what you've done in their life. May that be an encouragement and a reminder to us that we should be faithful as well uh, to tell others what Christ has done for us. Lord, we ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, thank you, Derek, and good evening to you. Welcome to the House of the Lord or for our Wednesday night service here at North Lake. And again, we do start off uh, in prayer uh, for our brothers and sisters across the southeast uh, as we're preparing for this hurricane, which I think is already coming ashore down in Louisiana and headed our way. And uh, we know 
uh, from the contact that we have with you, that we have a, a lot of folks who, who watch uh, from these areas, and so uh, we're praying for you tonight as we also pray for ourselves as this storm is also headed this way. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please uh, open to Acts chapter 12, and we'll get there in just a few moments. We want to talk tonight a little bit about angels. I've had a number of requests uh, for this study. I assume this interest in angels is happening because... Uh, we've been in this revelation study on Sunday mornings for the last eight months, and um, plenty of angel references in the revelation. Uh, angels have also been a popular subject, and they're still popular today. If you go to Christian bookstores, you see angel figurines and jewelry and books and movies and videos and songs. Uh, angels are uh, a popular topic also in the Bible, where they're mentioned over 270 times. Um, as we prepare for a study, you know, uh, for those of you who go to the blog, we always have a question of the week to kind of let you know where we're going on with our Wednesday night study. And so the question of the week was, as we prepare for this study, please select the best answer. That's the key thing, the best answer below. And we start with the word angel means A, messenger, B, minister, C, star, D, pastor, C, uh, E, all of the above, F, none of the above. Well, uh, the number one vote getter was Messenger at 79%. Uh, the number two was All of the Above at 19%. And somebody clicked on None of the Above. So I was fixing to say everybody's a winner tonight, but whoever said None of the Above is not the winner. But if you clicked any other box, uh, you got the right answer because the best answer is actually E, All of the Above. Uh, but tonight, uh, everybody's going to be a winner. So anyway... Uh, in both uh, Greek and Hebrew, uh, angel means messenger. So that was a good answer. Uh, but also means minister. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So the Lord sends angels to take care of those who believe in him and who trust in him. Also, there's some connection. I wish I could explain it, but it's better when we all some connection between angels and stars. Uh, Psalm 104.4, who angels, spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Uh, so uh, there's some connection between uh, fire or stars and this whole idea of angelic beings. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, it's talking about the cherub, who we know as Lucifer. And of course, Lucifer actually means day star. It said, day star walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Revelation 12.4 said, when he fell, when Lucifer or Satan fell, his tail drew a third of the stars from heaven. And then a couple of verses later, it talks about the angels who were cast out at the same time. So again, one place it calls them stars, and the next place it calls them angels. I'm not sure if that's a figure of speech or what's going on there. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, it says, He had in his right hand seven stars, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So again, you got angels and stars being um, uh, uh, kind of swapped uh, between the two. And then finally, there is a reference to pastors being angels. I knew you knew that. Right? Okay. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel, also known as the pastor, of the church at Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. So pastors are also called to be messengers uh, of God, angels of God. I know y'all think of me as being an angel, right? But anyway, uh, I'm supposed to be a messenger, and hopefully uh, all of us who are called to be pastors do realize that we have an important position uh, as messengers of the Lord when we deliver his word, uh, when we preach. So anyhow, let's begin with one of those 270 references to angels. And I chose this one because I think it covers a lot of ground uh, Acts chapter 12, I'll begin reading in verse 1 uh, through verse 11. Uh, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in the prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. 
And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So you tell, he's pretty well guarded here. Uh, he's got uh, soldiers all around him, chained to him, uh, also at all the doors. Verse 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know uh, what was done by the angel was for real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, the first automatic door you see right there in Scripture. And they went and went out into the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people, uh, which, of course, was to kill him. Let's look at a little background here right quick. Uh, uh, when we get to chapter 12 of um, Acts, you discover that the persecution of the church, of Christians, has already began with the martyrdom of Stephen back in chapter 7, and it continues on into chapter 12 here that I just read for you. And, of course, the leader of the persecution at this time is Herod Agrippa I. Uh, if you're familiar with, New, with the New Testament, then you know that the Herod family was a dynasty of political corruption. Their family history read like a soap opera or a reality show. Uh, they married their sisters and their cousins, uh, but they would kill their own kin if they happened to think their own kin was going to keep them from uh, having power. Uh, if you remember, Herod the Great was the grandfather of Agrippa, and he had the baby boys in Bethlehem killed uh, at the birth of Jesus Christ. And then there was Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist beheaded. You remember that story? And then we got Herod Agrippa I, had just killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and that made him popular with all the Jewish leaders, so now he's ready to further please this mob uh, by arresting Peter. And, of course, Herod intended to kill Peter too, but in verse 7 we see that Peter was touched awakened and rescued by an angel of the Lord. You know, uh, angels are in fashion these days. Uh, in a 2016 Gallup poll said 72% of Americans believe in angels. 12% said they were not sure, but only 16% said they didn't believe in angels. And maybe that's why they're so popular. There's dozens of books out there about them. There's angel figurines and pins and good luck charms are all popular collectibles. You can find them in jewelry stores, Christian bookstores, even dollar stores. I've even seen angel figurines in dollar stores for those who have a budget, I guess. So anyway, uh, they're, they're very popular out there. But part of the popularity, I think, uh, is probably connected to a popular TV show from back in the 90s called Touched by an Angel. Uh, it ran for nine seasons. Of course, it will last forever on reruns and DVDs. But the show starred Roma Downey as Monica, uh, Della Reese as Tess, and John Dye as Andrew. And this angelic trio were sent from heaven to help people with their problems and to spread the message that God loves and is going to save everybody. And these TV angels were not perfect. Uh, they were a lot like humans. They looked like humans. Uh, they fibbed and told stories like humans. They deceived. They manipulated. They made mistakes like humans. But it was always for a good cause. And so in the end, good always worked out, regardless of what they had to do to get to the good. And many people watched the show because it was unusual in that it was a decent show, especially compared to the sex, violence, and profanity that you see in most of the shows. Uh, but the problem is there was still lots of misinformation about angels in that program. So let's go to the Bible and see what the Lord has chosen to reveal to us about angels. Well, first, what does the Bible say about being touched by angels? Uh, again, well, angels, by definition, are messengers or ambassadors from the Lord. In chapter 12 and verse 7, we see this one called an angel of the Lord, and he was a messenger, a representative of the Lord. And Hebrews 1.14 says, Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Well, who's going to inherit salvation? Christians. 
So uh, they are sent here to take care of us, to lead us, to guide us, and often we don't even see them coming. I also want you to notice that angels are not human beings that get promoted to angel status after we die. I see that on tombstones. When I go through cemeteries to do funerals, it's not unusual to see a tombstone that says, gone to be an angel. Uh, no, uh, they're different than humans. You got angels and you got humans, and the two do not mix. Hebrews 2, 6 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. Angels are special, created, spiritual beings. They're, we are a little bit lower than those angels when it comes to knowledge, power, and also speed. Uh, angels are designed to do the will of God. They are spiritual beings where we are physical beings uh, with spirit. Well, how many angels are there? Well, the Bible says they are innumerable. Too many to count. Hebrews 12, 22. When you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you'll come to innumerable company of angels. Uh, of course, today they're one-third less than the original created number uh, because with the fall of Satan in Revelation chapter 12, it says his tail threw a third of the stars from the heaven, a third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion and became fallen angels or evil angels or demons. Still, there are so many that remain. Back in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 says, The Ancient of Days, also known as God, was seated and a thousand thousands, talking about angels, ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 11, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand. What is ten thousand times ten thousand? Quick. A hundred million? Somewhere between a hundred million and a billion because it goes on and says, and thousands of thousands. Revelation 12, 4 talks that somehow or another these angels are related to stars in the heaven and the stars in the heavens are, what, innumerable? So are the angels of God innumerable. Well, what do angels look like? Well, most of the time they are invisible to us because they dwell in a different dimension of reality. Uh, they are not locked into the time-space continuum like mortal men. Most of us live in four dimensions. Uh, we can see three of them. That is height, width, and depth. And we exist in time. So you and I, in the real world that we live in, we have four dimensions. Uh, theoretical physicists have worked up something called a string theory that there are at least ten dimensions of reality uh, we know four of them, length, width, height, and time. And then they add thought, feeling, electricity, magnetism. That brings you up to eight. When you get beyond those eight, they start getting into parallel universes, which I don't understand at all. Uh, I, th I reckon that's one of those things that Einstein uh, thought about in his uh, reality book that he wrote. Uh, but you actually see a little bit of that, just a little bit of it, reading in Daniel chapter 10, when it uh, talks about beyond the earthly kingdoms, there were also spiritual kingdoms. And so you have angels in a separate dimension of reality that also struggle um, with the, you know, the powers and principalities and high places that we read about in Ephesians. So again, there's a whole separate reality that you and I are not aware of, and that's where most of these uh, millions of angels dwell. Occasionally, angels will appear as winged creatures. Sixty times in Scripture it refers to cher the cherubim, and one time in Isaiah it refers to seraphim, and they look very similar if you look at the description, and they're angels with wings, and most of them don't have two wings. they got like six wings, so how do you picture a six-winged creature? But uh, nevertheless, that's how they're described in the Bible, and you see them at the Garden of Eden. Uh, you also see them in the temple. You actually have replicas on top of the Ark of the Covenant made out of gold that represent something else in the kingdom of heaven. And of course, we see those four cherubim or winged creatures uh, whenever you get to Revelation and look at them there. Uh, so that's the winged creatures. Speaking of wings, you remember the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life? I think that's where we get this idea that when you die, you become an angel and you get wings. But anyhow, if you'll remember... In that Christmas movie, George Bailey's little girl says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. 
Now, how many of you know that's not a biblical quote? So, so don't buy everything that you hear in the movies. As a, that's not a, a quote from the Bible. It probably comes from 16th century Roman Catholic Church uh, whenever they got into this fundraising scheme called indulgences. Indulgences is where they told the people who weren't allowed to read the Bible that when uh, your loved one dies, they actually don't go to heaven or hell. They go to a place called purgatory. And so if you pay some money to the church, it can actually help them move from purgatory into heaven. Um, and it's particularly helpful if the person is headed for hell, so you pay them a little bit more money in order to get them on up there. And this whole idea uh, of fundraising the church uh, using this idea was called indulgences. And so one of the things uh, uh, that was used to sell these things was a phrase put together by a man named John Tetzel that said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And so I think maybe that's where we come up with the angel gets its wings thing. But let me summarize. The Bible does not teach that there is a purgatory, nor does it teach that you can spring from purgatory, nor does it teach that people become angels with wings after they die. So we, hopefully we got that cleared up. Occasionally, angels do appear in human form, um, sometimes in glory and in splendor. You remember the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2? Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. What's host? Host is always a large group of angels. A multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, What? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And also, that was the birth of Christ. When we get to the resurrection of Christ, we also see angels appearing in human form again. Matthew 28. Now, after the Sabbath, first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear and became like dead men. Apparently they went into a coma. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. And all God's people said, Amen. And I can hear you out there in, in the online land too saying amen. Uh, people uh, who see angels, if you go back and read through, uh, they're on, on, normally awestruck. They don't really know what to do after they have seen an angel. Uh, Revelation 22, 8, you see the apostle John, when he saw and heard all these things, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed him those things. And then this angel said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of the book, worship God. See there, even John, as knowledgeable as he was by this point, still when he saw a heavenly being, he felt the need to bow and worship, awestruck. I'm always a little concerned and a little skeptical when I hear people talk about having encounters with angels and they have casual conversation. Uh, that's not the way it works in the Bible. Every time they see an angel, they are usually overwhelmed with the glory uh, and again they have to be told not to worship and we see that in Colossians 2.18 we're reminded that we are forbidden to worship angels we're supposed to worship the Lord who sends the angel we're supposed to worship the creator instead of the creature so sometimes angels appear in human form dazzling in glory and splendor sometimes angels appear as ordinary men so ordinary that we often overlook them in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for in doing so, some have unknowingly or unwittingly entertained angels. I wonder how many angels you and I have overlooked in our life. Uh, the Lord sent somebody and put them in our path, and we said, Ah, I ain't got time, move along, and didn't realize that we had one of those angels unawares uh, scenes there at that time. Several years ago, when I was a pastor in South Georgia, uh, one of my elderly deacons was seriously ill he was in the hospital in savannah and his wife told me the following story she said a man came in the room dressed in green scrubs she said i thought it was a doctor or a nurse uh, 
said, didn't speak to me, just went straight over to the bed and began to talk to this deacon and ask him how he was being treated. And they chit-chatted about that, and then he asked him if he was ready to go. And he said, yes. And he said, okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow about 6 p.m. And so this deacon's wife didn't recognize the man, so she went out in the hall and didn't see him in the hall. So she walked down to the nurse's station and gave, him a, uh, gave them a description of what this person looked like, and the nurses said they didn't know who she was talking about. They hadn't seen him or anyone that would fit that description on that hall the whole day. She said, it seemed very strange to me. And then the next day at 6 p.m., he went to be with the Lord. So what do you think? Maybe that was an angel unaware. Another interesting fact about angel encounters is in that TV show, two of the star angels were female, and almost all angel figurines that I have ever seen are beautiful women with wings. But actually, Jesus told us that angels are neither male nor female. Matthew twenty two thirty four. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given Mary, but they are like the angels of God in heaven. And also in the Bible, angels are always presented not as male, but in the masculine gender. It's always referred to as him or his or he. And the only named angels in the Bible have masculine names. And who are they? I can hear you out there online. Michael and Gabriel and the bad guy, Lucifer, but all their names, if you'll look them up, are uh, described to us in the masculine. Well, what do angels do? Well, angels minister or serve the Lord. Psalm 103, 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, who heed the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all ye his host. And what do we say host is? When you say Lord of hosts, it means Lord of all the multitudes of angels in heaven. Uh, bless the Lord, all ye his host, who ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Another thing about angels is angels know more than we do, but they're not omniscient. Uh, they're, they don't know everything. Only God does. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus, talking about his second coming, said, Of that day and of that hour, no one knows, no, not even the angels, but my Father only. So again, they don't, they don't know everything. Also in 1 Peter 1, 12, he's describing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation. It says, Such things the angels desire to look into. So again, angels know a lot, but they don't understand the relationship that you and I have. They, they stand in awe of that, uh, that we can have personal relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's a part of them that they're not eligible for uh, because they are everlasting beings in their own right unless they were part of those fallen angels. Angels are also powerful, but they're not omnipotent. They're not all-powerful. Only God is. Uh, but God equips them to, with sufficient power to do whatever he sends them to do. Sometimes God sends angels to save, like he did Peter. Here in verse 7 that we read just a few moments ago, Peter was touched by this angel to wake him up and to rescue him from death row. Sometimes God sends angels to carry believers to heaven. We saw that with James in verse 2. Uh, he went to be with the Lord. Other believers who die were told that the angels come and get us. Luke 16, 22, Jesus says, So it was that the beggar, Lazarus, died, and he was carried by the angels to paradise. Sometimes God sends angels to destroy and to punish sin. And with that, I hope you still got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 12 because we see another action by the angels. And we'll begin there in verse 20. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration, got up and gave this great speech. And of course, you got these people here who are trying to make peace with him now. So while he is making his great oration, they kept shouting, Amen, and this is the voice of a God and not a man. You know, they're really pumping him up there, and he was glorying it, really enjoying it. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him 
because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Wow. Uh, Herod was also touched by an angel, but that's a little different touch than what you saw on the TV show. It's a little different touch than what Peter had. Um, you know, Tess and Della on the TV show, they were always nice and loving angels. But you have to remember that Della Reese is an ordained minister in the Unity Church, a Unitarian type church that believes God manifests himself through all religions and that God will ultimately save everybody. As Della once said in an interview, God is that religious feeling in all of us. Get in touch with the feeling and life will be good and heaven will be even better. But the Bible teaches that God is not only a loving God, but he is also a holy and righteous God, and he will judge sin, and he's going to judge the sins of the world. And again, oftentimes, he uses angels to do it. For example, in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 19, it only took two angels to level Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. Think about that, and then think about the love of Jesus Christ. What did he, what did he say when... His disciples tried to defend him from being arrested. He said, I can call what? Ten legions? Ten legions of angels. How many did it take to blow up Sodom and Gomorrah? Two. What would he have done if he called 10,000 angels? I don't think the earth would have survived that. But he said, no, leave this alone. I'm going to the cross to die for your sin. So again, it was not that they took Jesus. It's Jesus laid down his life for us. So again, you see the power of these angels. If you remember Numbers chapter 22 and verse 23, Balaam was going against the will of God. And if you remember, he sent the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a sword drawn in his hand. And even though Balaam couldn't see him, who could see him? The donkey. And the donkey ended up having to say, hey, there's an angel in the way here. We need to stop this thing. Uh, but again, he sent an angel of the Lord uh, to do something about the sin that was fixing to go on with Balaam and his entourage. And then we're in the book of Revelation on Sunday morning, and if you remember, it only took seven angels with seven trumpets to devastate the earth in the trumpet judgments. And later, it only took seven angels with bowls full of the wrath of God to judge and avenge the blood of God's children who have been persecuted and martyred for their faith down through the centuries. Again, it only took seven of those guys. What about guardian angels? I hear that a lot. Do you believe that Christians have guardian angels? Well, um, look back up there to verse 15 in the passage that we just read. The early church apparently believed that we had guardian angels. In verse uh, 15 it says... Uh, oh, well, it's kind of funny what happened there. You know, it said the church was praying for Peter, that Peter would not be killed, and that Peter would be released and all this kind of stuff. So the angel of the Lord comes through and delivers him, and so he goes to where the church is meeting at a house, and he begins to knock on the door, if you remember. And so they go to the door, and there's Peter, an answer to the prayer. And what do they do? They close the door. <laughs> Somebody looks like Peter. Well, it's Peter, let him in. So, you know, you're asking God to deliver him, and then God delivers him, and we're not expecting him to deliver him. How many of our prayers go like that as well? So, anyway, uh, this girl named Rhoda, um, they said to her, you are beside yourself. It's not Peter at the door. But she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. So, again, apparently they believed that he had a guardian angel. Maybe the guardian angel of Peter was coming to tell them what the situation was. No, it was Peter, the guardian angel, had released him, and so now he was free. Uh, so, again, yeah, they believed he had a guardian angel. Uh, Matthew 18, 10, Jesus was preaching. and said, Take heed that you do not offend one of these little children who are coming to me, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Whose angels? These children of God that's got their faith in Jesus Christ, they have an angel, their angel, using a possessive there. Psalm 34, 7 from the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear and who, who, uh, who fear him and he delivers them. Speaking of deliverance, um, Billy Graham wrote a book about angels that sold a bunch of copies uh, way back, I guess, in the 70s now. And he tells the story of a missionary friend of his named John Patton who served in the South Pacific who told the story of an encounter that they had with hostile natives 
Uh, the natives came one night and surrounded the missionary's house, intended to burn the house to the ground and kill them. And the Pattons prayed all night that God would deliver them. Well, when daylight finally came, they were surprised to see that all the natives had left. And so they thanked God for answering their prayers. Well, about a year later, the chief of the tribe became a Christian. And once he became a Christian, uh, Brother Patton was talking with him and asked him what had kept them from burning the house down that night. And the chief said, all those men. And Patton said, what men? There was no one there except for me and my wife. And the chief said he and his warriors saw hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords all around the house. I don't know, that kind of sounds like the story of Elijah, doesn't it? Remember in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 6, king of Syria was making war against Israel, but every time he'd go out on the battlefield, whatever he planned to do, it turns out that Israel was always prepared for the counterattack. It's almost like they knew what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. The uh, Syrian king got paranoid. He thought that he had a spy in his ranks that was telling what the battle plans were to the uh, children of Israel. And his soldiers said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is there's this prophet of God named Elijah, and the Lord tells him what you're going to do. And so that's how we're able to win the battle. So therefore, the king of Syria said, well, we'll put a fix to that. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army there around where Elijah lived, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of Elijah rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots and his servant ran back in and said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so Elijah answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I'm sure Elijah's servant said, How do you calculate that? <laughs> All we got is me and you. And this place is surrounded, I'm telling you. And then Elijah prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And so the Lord opened the eyes of this young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Isn't that an amazing, amazing story? Let me ask you as we close tonight, do you believe in angels? Do you believe that the Lord has special angels, guardian angels, to take care of you? Well, if you're a Christian... You do. You have that reality. Hebrews 1.14, angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. If you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you will inherit salvation. And according to the Word of God, that means that you have angels who will be ministering to you to take care of you. Sometimes uh, it may be a, a messenger to encourage you in your darkest hour. In Luke 22, it records where Jesus... Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. How many of you have felt that comfort, that encouragement during your darkest hour? You may not have been able to see him. That angel may have been in the next dimension, but nevertheless, he was there to comfort and encourage you. Sometimes it may be a messenger of deliverance, answering prayers, saving your life like in the case of Peter in Acts chapter 12. Sometimes it may be a messenger of judgment who the Lord sends to punish your enemies, like he did King Herod in Acts chapter 12 that we just read. And sometimes it may be those angels from heaven's throne uh, sent to minister to you at the time of your death, at the time of your passing, the time when you go to be with the Lord, uh, and they come swinging low in that sweet chariot, coming for to carry you home. And when that happens, don't be afraid. Just look at them and say, into your hand I commit my spirit because that's what they're there for. They're there to take you home. So if you're a believer, a born-again child of God, the Lord has given us angels. Just one more benefit of being a Christian. That's why King David in the Old Testament, Psalm 103, used to say, Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. How many of y'all know how many benefits you've received from God through the years? Well, we talked about one more tonight as he sends an angel to take care of you. Just one more benefit of our Lord. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your precious promises to your children, for reminding us 
that you have angels that come to minister to us for putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and somebody to help us through the things that we face in this life. And Lord, I thank you for the promise that you shared through your prophet Isaiah who told us that in all of our afflictions, you were afflicted and you send the angel of your presence to save us. That in your love and in your pity, you redeem us and you carry us all the days of our life. And Lord, we thank you for carrying us and for taking care of us and ministering to us through your angels in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.